Good afternoon. I've been on a climate journey for the past six or seven years, and along the way I've met a lot of really interesting people that have helped me understand what we're dealing with around climate change. No one has influenced me more in this six-year journey than Spencer Glendon. I had the great fortune of meeting Spencer about a year and a half, two years ago. He has dramatically changed how I view the world around climate change and climate risk, and I'm really incredibly excited for him to join us today to be able to share his wisdom with the rest of you. Spencer, thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you, Jeff. Thanks for the kind introduction. So, Spencer, when I read Sapiens, the book, and I started understanding that the Earth has really only had a stable climate for around the last 10,000 years, and that's what allowed us to create the civilizations that exist across the planet today, what I didn't understand at that time is that that stability was coming to an end. What is the issue with people really understanding how to grok an issue so big that has been so stable for the last 10 to 12,000 years? What is the difficulty of humans really accepting that that might be changing right now? So that's the important basis, I think, for understanding climate change at all, is that it's not that the climate has always been changing. It's that for 10,000 years, the climate didn't change. And during that time, we developed civilization. And civilization is a complex set of relationships, but all of it is based on the idea of stability, stability of location, that you can build and invest in things for the long term. And what I think happens is that the longer something is stable, the less you recognize it. The longer something is stable, the more you just assume it's the way it is. And I even look at how we talk about places like London is rainy. It's not that it's rainy now, it's that it implicitly always was and always will be. And we've come to this complacency that the earth is the way it's been since we were civilized. And what I want to point out to people is before that time, the earth was very unstable and humans as a result were nomads. If you didn't know where the nice places were going to be, you kept chasing them and you moved from one place to the other to avoid the ice or to avoid the raging heat. But we've been in place for so long that we think the, the limits of our imagination have shrunk and our assumption of what's given or what we take for granted have become further and further entrenched, including in things like what I, I think we'll probably talk about, financial models. So that is the big question. If the climate is becoming unstable, are the financial models that we're using today really adequate in assessing that risk? So the financial models we're using have two shortcomings in assessing that risk. The first is that they are all trained essentially on the last 75 years. Almost nobody uses financial models that are long, older than 50 years or uses data that goes back further than that. But certainly nobody uses data that goes back 12,000 years. And as a result, we're using models that were developed in a period of time that uh, is fundamentally unlike what's coming. So we have this problem that would be called out of sample problem, which is that everything that's coming from the climate we've not seen before, but we have really fine models for what's come before. And this brings me to the second problem of the financial models is that long periods of stability lead to a use of precision. So what I tell people about climate change and their models is uh, that on the, in the first hand, there are missing variables. There's nowhere in a spreadsheet to assess the value of a company or a piece of real estate or the municipal bonds for something that is outside of the financial market. So there isn't anything about terrible storms. There isn't anything about exodus. There isn't anything about mass migration. The, the key variables are missing. And then the second part is they're, they've worked so hard to make their financial models be precise to two decimal places that it's hard for them to think in what I would call inframarginal or nonlinear changes. And if you look at the economics of climate change that are you know, the models of William Nordhaus and others, those models are actually incapable of producing nonlinear change. They take the past and say, well, the future will be like the recent past, just with some climate change. And as a result, all of our forecasts of the future, are pretty gradual, are pretty smooth, seem like they'd be pretty easy to adjust to. But that's because we've ruled out the possibility that they might not be. Spencer, you have this concept of edges. Can you describe to us what you mean by that and how that might disrupt the current models that we're looking at? Sure. So what I think about is that 
because we've lived in a stable environment for so long, we've maximized and optimized a lot of our infrastructure and the ways we live. So these consistent patterns are now embodied in the way we live. And those patterns have boundaries. Now, what I think about is that everywhere around the world, every piece of infrastructure, every person's job, every person's house or community has certain edges that are at risk of being crossed. Some of these are very hard for other people to see, but I think once you have this mindset, it's not that hard. So let's start with the easiest one, which is the coast of the ocean. It's clearly an edge that if you violate it, big problems happen, which is to say, if you assess where the ocean will be and it turns out to instead be in your living room or in the basement of your building or overwhelming your whole town, the crossing the edge from outside the ocean to inside the ocean is catastrophic. I think that's why there's so much attention on sea level rise. It's this easy to understand edge, but actually there are edges in all kinds of things. So you're in a nearly empty Manhattan, but all of the buildings in Manhattan are built with tolerances for how many days there will be above 90 degrees. And if it exceeds that, those buildings break down. Those buildings are literally not built for the right infrastructure. Neither is the entire grid. There are other things like the edges around agriculture. Many agricultural products need to have a hard frost in order to have a good yield the next year. If you lose those days below zero uh, centigrade or 32 degrees Fahrenheit, the whole agricultural system changes. And so those edges exist in things like the grade of roads, the way the buildings are engineered. A big one that will be a big problem around the world is storm sewers. So storm sewers are built with specific tolerances based on past data. And because warmer air holds much more moisture, for every one degree C warmer the air is, it holds 7% more moisture. It means that warmer air is going to give us bigger and bigger downpours. Well, those storm drains weren't built for the storms to come. And so that infrastructure will be overwhelmed. It may not mean that those places are unlivable. It means, though, that they have the wrong infrastructure and there will have to be a huge amount of spending just to fix back to some sort of stability for those places. And the longer climate change goes on, the further those edges keep moving. And that's what I want people to understand most is that we're when you think about this idea of keeping warming below one and a half or two degrees C, it's in hopes that you keep the edges from moving forever. Because if the edges are moving perpetually, eventually what the reaction is, is I'm not going to build anything long term. I'm not going to invest long term because the boundaries of what is coming keep moving. And so this is the last piece, I think, that's fundamental for uh, understanding the risks in finance of climate change is that I think duration will go away in the markets, which is the more people see change coming, the less long-term capital they'll be willing to offer. And so as we cross edges locally, nationally, internationally, we get to the last edge that nobody wants to talk about, but is the edges of nations and migration. And so most of the economics of climate change assume everybody stays put where they are and how to model what would happen if that changed is beyond the scope of, of most markets. When you say it's beyond the scope of most markets, are you saying that there's really a failure of imagination of human beings to comprehend or disassociate from the current stability that we've been dealing with? Yeah, I think that there is a, that you've used the right word, imagination. I think that there's a, there are kinds of risks that are easily quantifiable. And then there are some kinds of risks that are hard to quantify, but are still quantifiable. And if you look at how financial markets work, today in particular, if it can't be quantified, it's not considered a risk. It's left outside altogether. And that's the kind of risk that I worry most about, which is that the, the, the risk that yields are four and a half versus four, or that inflation is three versus two, those risks are well understood um, and thoroughly modeled. But the idea that there just won't be a 30 year mortgage somewhere, or that all of a sudden emerging markets financing will dry up for North Africa. The consequences of that are not likely to be small, but nobody knows how to put them into a spreadsheet. And I think the only way to do that is with a kind of a risk mindset that allows for the unquantifiable. There's a famous quote by uh, Charles Deming that is misquoted as uh, you can only manage what you measure, but it leaves out that the most important things aren't measurable that actually you need to manage things you can't measure. And I feel like the financial markets have left alone things that can't be measured. And they are vulnerable to 
uh, changes in those assumptions and changes that come from outside. In that way, COVID is somewhat similar, which is that COVID, the, the reason people aren't going to work isn't because the price isn't right or the wage isn't right. It's something that's outside of financial markets has hit the system and nobody knows how to model it. When I saw you speak last year at the release of the Mackenzie Woods Hole papers, I heard you say something that I found incredibly interesting, especially for the capital markets assumptions. You said when everyone is asking when, when it's when, it's too late. Can you elaborate on that a little bit? Sure. So we went through a period of time uh, for the last many years when climate change was going to matter sometime in some degree. But we're now at a point along some of these edges, whether it's in Florida or whether it's in California or whether it's in uh, other parts of the world, Australia is a good example, where these edges are being breached and people can see it. They can see the proximity of the ocean or the proximity of the fires. And it's just a matter of whether they can eke out a few more years. So your uh, uh, memory comes from my talking about being on a, a radio program and in Florida. And before I even got on the air, the hostess was asking me when she should sell. And that wound up being the tone of the, of the call. They were ready for people to push back. And all really people wanted to know was how to get out and where to go when they get out. What's the problem with that is that you have, uh, we have a good history of this uh, economically, which is when a location becomes a place that people know they're going to leave. Once that market starts going down, it goes down catastrophically. Um, it's not clear who would move in and there's a race to get out. And that race may happen well before the swampiness hits wherever you live, but out of a sense that I need to be before the next person. And so this is a kind of transition risk that I worry a lot about, which is that it becomes disorderly very quickly. And one of the ways that can happen is that banks, in, in the case of Florida real estate or California real estate, is that either banks or insurance companies just decide this isn't a place to do business. We have a notion that partly comes from portfolio theory that people need to diversify everywhere. But I think there will be pockets of places where there just isn't any capital available because the prospective lenders will say, I don't know enough. There's too much uncertainty and they walk away. And we have evidence of that over the past hundred years in parts of the United States and parts of emerging markets. And every time that happens, the, the exodus is much faster than expected and the effect on prices is much more severe. Spencer, obviously we're dealing with a tremendous amount of risks. When we think about climate change, we're looking at extreme weather, extreme heat, floods, droughts, food scarcity, water scarcity, issues that the average person maybe doesn't even want to comprehend. Um, let alone have the imagination, as you pointed out, to, to comprehend. What does the future look like to you around the capital markets, and what are some significant changes that we can hope to see that might help this transition? Uh, so a couple of things. The first is that I think that we need to get to the point where the capital markets participants understand that they can't coordinate to solve this problem. The problem won't be solved by having more alpha, and it also won't be solved by everybody going their own way. And if you have a long enough memory, you know this is true uh, from times in the past when there needed to be coordinated effort to save markets. Why? Because markets rely on trust, rely on a sense of stability, rely on a set of norms. But it's impossible for the, the individual participants in the market to create those. And so I like to give the example of the last great Chicago fire, which was that uh, the last of the fires in the United States in particular, where cities went up and burned down. And the last great Chicago fire caused a reaction by the insurance industry, which says, until you regulate these buildings, until you regulate these cities, we're not providing any more capital. And that's how in the United States, we wound up with fire departments and building codes, that there needed to be discipline that came from within the market that required everybody to, to change the rules. And so it's the changes of rules that I think are most important. And what I think needs to happen is for the largest participants in the markets to clarify and ask for those rules. And I think the second part of it is this needs to be thought of not as a maximization or optimization problem, but as a risk problem. 
the, the downside from slightly moving slightly faster is so much smaller than the downside from not moving at all. That the loss of capitalism altogether, the loss of real civility, I think is a great risk. And until you understand that, you're gonna fritter around about whether the right cost of carbon is $60 or $70. And I fully embrace the mindset that you should start with a high price of carbon. And if you just figure out that you're moving too fast, you can slow down. But this system has momentum. And if we keep moving marginally, 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 we'll be behind it the whole way as those larger risks grow. And so you need big institutions to ask for regulation and you need that regulation to be more aggressive than you might think, which can be scaled back later if need be. But the failure to act at all is, m and the problem of acting too fast isn't symmetric with the problem of acting too slowly. The problem of act, acting too slowly is much, much more dire. So I'm hopeful that people like you and, the, and events like this can change that conversation to be just about from just about what are you doing to what are we doing and from worrying about whether your yield is four or three and a half to what do we do to save this system? And I think that's possible. Spencer, thank you so much for being with us at the Nest for Climate Week. I'm always inspired by listening to you and always learn something. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye-bye.